and we'll um, close our session. I think it's closing our session with uh, a talk from Rudolph, who will maybe give us a, an umbrella perspective that uh, sort of ties these ideas together. Rudolph, welcome and thank you for being here. Okay, so I want to talk about um, species discovery at a large scale for especially those taxa that need it. So I'm very much also focusing on dark taxa like Emily also did. Um, and for that, I always like start by reminding everyone what animal biodiversity looks like, although I think in this particular group, it's probably not so important. It's mostly when it comes to biomass on the terrestrial in terrestrial habitats, it's mostly uh, arthropods and annelids. Then comes the things that we eat, then we come, comes us, and then uh, there's very little others when it comes to biomass. If you then uh, re-scale um, uh, this uh, image to look at species diversity, it becomes pretty much all arthropods. And I would say 90% of the arthropods are not described. Of course, uh, a similar number would apply to nematodes. Is this reflected in our biodiversity data? So we can actually go to um, GBIF. And if you look at GBIF, then there's now two, more than 2 billion records in GBIF, and of which uh, about uh, three quarters are bird records. So it's really the global bird um, uh, information facility, with insects and arthropods having a very large, small proportion of the data, roughly equivalent to what is available for ducks and geese. But why is there so little um, uh, data for most species? And it has to do with um, our traditional biases, our taxon biases in biodiversity sciences. And I think this is where we have to be a little bit critical of ourselves, because we have um, selected a certain taxa uh, based on certain characteristics to work on, which maybe because of uh, the existing techno technologies uh, was really not much of a choice. We couldn't really work on anything else, but we really focus on things that are pretty. We're focusing on things that are pretty large. We are focusing on things that are pretty diurnal. Nocturnal animals are much less likely to work to be worked on. We focus on things that are pretty endangered, and that has less left us with incredibly biased data on biodiversity. I think economists have long realized that what uh, biologists are doing is not entirely um, um, uh, satisfactory because they have pointed out that ugly species deserve biodiversity protection too. And when we talk about dark taxa, we oftentimes talk about things that are only pretty if you really uh, have um, zoom in images and you look at the morphological details. But most of us uh, tend to also not look at dark taxa because they're too small. So this is what it really looks like when you do um, biodiversity sampling for arthropods. Uh, you end up with a mass sample like this, which contains thousands of specimens, uh, oftentimes for five, five, six hundred species. Uh, and we really don't know how to deal with these samples adequately. They consist of large numbers of uh, specimens. They consist of large numbers of undescribed species. And they also, the species in those uh, samples contribute a large amount of the functional diversity in biodiversity. They may not even contribute all that much biomass, though, because a lot of these subtaxa are really small. They're abundant. But even if you put them all together, they're probably not uh, constituting most of the biomass. So what we're trying to do at the Center for Integrative um, Biodiversity Discovery at the Naturkunde Museum in Berlin is uh, try to deal exactly with these uh, uh, groups that are so plentiful that they are really hard to work with uh, using traditional techniques. Now, if you have a, a scaling problem, you may need something like a factory. So that's why we call this uh, the building of a species discovery factory. And it really consists of three parts. The first part is a robot. This robot is capable of finding specimens in a sample, taking images of individual specimens, and then moving those specimens into a microplate. Just taking images is not terribly useful because you have no idea what you are imaging. However, once you have moved it over into a microplate, you can, of course, then doing DNA, do DNA barcoding. And we have developed particularly cheap ways of doing that. And once you have an image and you have a DNA barcode, you can assign these images to, to putative species. And once you have enough images for a particular species, you can develop uh, AI identification mechanisms or identification uh, algorithms, which in the future allows you to sort out the really common species and then focusing on the rarer ones uh, in future taxonomic pursuits. So let me go into a bit more detail about these three different steps. 
The first thing is the um, uh, diversity scanner, this robot. It finds an insect in a sample, it images each specimen, it classifies it, the specimen to family level at this point, and uh, the algorithms are only trained for the common families at this point. It measures the specimen and it also prepares it for DNA barcoding. And here's the um, robot in action. So you see an overview image being taken so that we know where the specimens are. Then there's an individual image being taken of one particular specimen. A pipette comes up and sucks up the specimen and moves it over into a microplate. Uh, it's being shown another time here at a higher magnification. It will be working on a specimen at the bottom low, low corner. Here's the pipette sucking it up and moving it over into the microplate. We're still optimizing the diversity scanner, but we hope next year it can go into serial production. The kind of images that we're getting from these um, uh, from the scanner is actually remarkably good from my point of view, because this is imaging and alcohol, which uh, traditionally is really not that easy. And these images are um, deliberately uh, uh, made uh, to a quality that is also useful for uh, rough taxonomic work. Although for training convolutional neural networks, we, do, we wouldn't even need this kind of quality. At this point, the um, robot is um, also measuring the specimens, mostly measuring the length. It's also trying to do a volumetric measurement. But of course, you can't really do this based on a 2D scanner. That's why there's two models of the 3D scanner uh, that is already op that are already op operational. This is the first one where the specimen is in the middle and the camera is going around the specimen. And that means that the same specimen will be captured in multiple images, which then also allows you to go to 3D modeling. So imaging alone doesn't help us with anything because then we have a lot of images of unknown specimens and unknown unidentified specimens. So the next step is uh, barcoding. And here we are really uh, emphasizing the use of these portable barcoding, uh, um, bar portable sequences that are costing very little. And that can also be used in many different uh, uh, locations because it's not expensive to build a barcoding lab that is using a min ion sequencer. Uh, so what we're doing is uh, known as mega barcoding. So we are actually having simplified the process of getting a barcode. We can get a barcode including all the consumable costs for 10 cents, and we can get them at large scale as uh, Emily already mentioned earlier. So we can do 10,000 specimens per flow cell, uh, which then also means that we have 10,000 vials to manage. And I'll talk about that in a minute uh, because Matt was already mentioning that as a problem. So how do we actually pool 10,000 um, uh, PCR products and still be able to assign them to individual specimens? Uh, that is done by using tagged amplicon sequencing. So the forward and the reverse primer has a tag. If you have like a 96 well plate with uh, individually different tags for each um, well, and you have three forward primers that are also tagged, you can produce 288 different combinations. If you have 200 different forward primers, you can do 20,000 different combinations. Afterwards, you can pull, pull all the PCR products and you can assign the reads that you get doing sequencing back to specimens by using the tag combinations. So we are not doing this kind of like uh, microscopic uh, complicated molecular work that you're used to. We instead, we are dealing with huge amounts of quantity. So this is like the PCR products for 10,000 uh, specimens. You get them by just pooling 10,000 different PCR products. Of course, you only have to clean up a very small proportion of that for sequencing. Uh, this can be done in your kitchen, literally. Um, you can uh, run a sequencing um, facility on this table here. So this is like the sequencer on the left, uh, the Minine sequencer, which is hooked up to a regular uh, computer uh, that is recording the barcodes as they become available. As a, a result of, of this operation, we're getting the usual uh, DNA sequencing file. So this is a FASTA file here. Uh, we like to illustrate these FASTA files using something that we call a cluster fusion um, diagram where we have like the metadata here in, uh, in the FASTA file, which is displayed at uh, the once end of this diagram. And then we're using um, branching to show where, how different the different um, specimens are in terms of uh, barcoding distances. So these are barcoding distance here. 
I'm only showing you this because well, it tells you a little bit about what kind of information we can we can get. So this is a movie that is 45 minutes long, and uh, it shows us 350,000 specimens. And every time um, the uh, a line is crossing here, my mouse at about 3%, a new species is coming through. So you can do species discovery at a very high rate. Uh, in this case, this particular movie uh, would have 9,000, approximately 9,000 species. Uh, this means, means managing thousands of voucher specimens. And uh, what we have been doing is uh, co-opting um, existing systems that have been developed for uh, biomedicine. Uh, so this is a system here, a, a box that can hold up to 200,000 half milliliter vials, which is a good size for most of the dark taxa. And it's a, essentially a vending machine for specimens. Um, each of the vials has like a QR code at the bottom and the vending machine knows exactly where every specimen is at any point in time. And uh, what we mostly use it is for, is for sorting. So it works like this. We have like all these vials with specimens inside. The, it's, the specimens are being sucked up. At the bottom of every vial, there's a QR code. The QR code is being read in. Then the vial is being stored in this gigantic uh, cylinder. Um, and of course, the instrument knows exactly where the different vials are. So the important part here is the retrieving. Once we have barcoded the specimens, we know which uh, vials are likely uh, containing specimens for the same species. So we can now export the uh, specimens by species. So we, we do the sequencing in total random order, but then by the time we have exported everything, it is exported in roughly species level. And this is how we manage uh, the specimens. So ultimately what this is all about is like we're starting with chaos. So we do barcoding and imaging, and then we create out of this chaos something that we're much more familiar with, which is uh, jars that would be in, um, in uh, an alcohol collection. Uh, and the whole thing can be sorted using the principle of priority because every single specimen, of course, has also a specimen identifier and each uh, cluster uh, with, uh, consisting of multiple vials can be sorted by the lowest identifier that uh, is uh, found in this particular cluster. Ultimately, we need to go to AI because we want to get rid of all the common species because they're less interested in common species when it comes to species discovery. And for this, what we can do is we can start training AI algorithms for automatically identifying specimens without sequencing. So we want to get rid of sequencing. Uh, at this point, the diversity scanner has been trained to recognize these species with uh, these families with roughly 90% uh, accuracy. Uh, why these families? Because these are the families that are particularly common in uh, Malay traps. Um, these results are, to me, actually quite satisfying in the sense that we only have one image for doing um, the identification, and it's doing a reasonably good job at it. And it's now two years old. I think the latest algorithms would do a better job. Now, the common taxa will benefit first from the, um, training the AI algorithms because you always need about 30, 40, 50 images before you can start doing the imaging, uh, the, the training. Uh, ultimately, AI identification evolves from family to genus to species, and we have um, the first um, species level uh, CNNs, and uh, they're doing surprisingly well. I mean, they're certainly doing better than I would if I have to look at specimens uh, belonging to families where I have no taxonomic knowledge. So we're now training algorithms for the most common species in an environment like Berlin. Insect samples, aren't they hopeless? This is what you, most people uh, think when they look at these kind of malaise trap samples. But I think you can break down the problem into smaller problems and then they're not hopeless. So how can you get started? You have an area X, you want to know what's in that area. Uh, you can do something like you barcode 2,000 specimens for 500 sites, that's a million specimens. It sounds like a lot, but in terms of like a consumable cost, that's $100,000, so it's not that expensive. And if you're working on a small area, you would probably not want to do a million specimens. How many species would you get? Based on our experience, um, we would get tens of thousands of species. How many is, of course, dependent on how many different habitats you're sampling, at what times, and uh, at what geographic range. But it's not unrealistic to get 50,000 species. Uh, then you can image uh, the numerically important species and start training the CNNs. And you would certainly get CNNs for a few thousand common species. And that's exactly what you want if you want to get the common species out of the way in order to focus on the rare species. 
this kind of like um, pros, uh, project would yield unbiased abundance and diversity data for 500 sites, uh, as biased, as unbiased as it, the chaps will be able to deliver to you. It will uh, also give you lots of vouchers, barcodes, and CNNs for the common and abundant uh, species. And critical information on distributions and ecology for species in dark taxa, where we have next to no good information on distribution and ecology. So you can also do dark taxonomy with biomonitoring focus, which is something I think that uh, we may have to do in order to convince uh, funders to give us uh, the necessary means. So here's like um, um, an example for how dark taxonomy can go from a group that is really poorly known to uh, having all the common species being described and being suitable for biomonitoring. So the process is a five step process. The first step is collecting. Collecting, we kind of know, um, uh, how to do. And in, uh, when it comes to biomonitoring and insects, uh, collecting is mostly done with Malay straps when it comes to small flying insects. So you could start by just getting fresh material. And we deliberately do something that uh, you will probably not like very much. We ignore the collection material. We deliberately only work on fresh material initially. Then we pre-sort the specimens with DNA barcodes. Then we do species delimitation with two data sources. This is a lit that um, you already heard from, about uh, from, um, from Emily. And delimit species delimitation with two data sources is a lot easier when you have done the pre-sorting with barcoding because you have already images, images from the diversity scanner, and you have information on how similar the barcodes are for closely related species. That also tells you which species you need to compare because if you have 400 species in a sample, you can't compare all species with each other. You want to be comparing the species that are closely related based on barcodes. So this is the diagram that will tell you what is closely related. Yeah, and then uh, you have to go through the lit process in order to uh, figure out which clusters barcode classes were wrong and which cl barcode classes are in agreement with, con with morphology. And uh, on average, actually in every single case so far, we have found that uh, barcode clusters um, clustered at different distances um, are congruent with morphological evidence. So finding congruence is actually not that difficult. So then comes a much more difficult path, which is identify or describe. Because just because you have delimited a species doesn't, you, you don't know whether they already, that species is already described or, uh, or and can be identified or needs to be described. And this is like uh, one of the big frontiers. And that's where we need these corpuses of uh, taxonomic descriptions, uh, existing taxonomic ex descriptions in order to make this job easier. But also, of course, museomics will also make this job easier because we will be able to match barcodes also based on uh, sequence information. Now we have run this uh, experiment once with um, the mycetophility of uh, Singapore. We described 120, we found 120 species in a taxonomic sample. Five, only five were described. 115 were new species, which we uh, now described. But then if we really want to get ready for biomonitoring, we need to check whether the species that we just described are also the species that are common enough that they are relevant for biomonitoring. So for this, we have the fifth step in our uh, protocol. So we have a taxonomic sample that we use for finding out how many species are in a particular environment. And then we have a test sample to see what proportion of the test sample is represented by the species that were in the taxonomic sample. And it turns out that uh, the proportion of species that are in both samples is very high. So if you're here looking at the second, the test sample and see what proportion of the species are in the, we're also in the first sample, then that's 79%. And only 21% were in only the second sample. If you look at the specimens, then 97% of all the specimens in the second sample were also in the first sample, because by describing the species in, from the first sample, we managed to cover most of the common species. So we can actually go from unknown to ready for biomonitoring in five steps, and at the same time making a major contribution to taxonomy because we described 115 species. So future natural history museums could consist of this. You sample, but then instead of putting unsorted material into the collection, you digitize, you barcode, and you put species specimens into putative um, species, and then they go into the collection. Taxonomists come in, and they have pre-sorted material. They don't do species level sorting that has been done for them. So in conclusion, society expects us to know 
biodiversity. We're not doing a terribly good job at it because we focus mostly on things that are large and not very abundant. Um, a major challenge in getting this knowledge is to uh, be able to handle dark taxa. And I think we can handle dark taxa with the kind of techniques that I described, but of course there is a lot of additional development work to be done. And this is what we do at the Center for uh, Integrative Biodiversity Discovery, where we are now about 17 scientists, uh, mostly working on taxonomic uh, questions. And with that, I'm coming to an end. Thanks so much, Rudolf. It's really inspiring to hear that uh, story from the beginning to where you're at right now. Very cool. Um, so as an unrelated question, as you guys are, as the rest of you are thinking about your questions for Rudolf, I will have some if there are none, but um, Peter asks, is there a way to create breakout rooms during the meeting? Uh, for example, on ChatGPT or image analysis? Yes, absolutely, Peter. That is what the unconference section will, will be available to do. Um, essentially, we'll meet for five or 10 minutes in the unconference sessions each day, uh, decide what topics we want, and then we will spin out breakout rooms um, to, to manage that process. So that is definitely possible. Um, um, we have questions in time, and then for Johan, do we have time for a question or two? Yeah, sorry, did you say, I'm sorry, Debbie, where was the question coming from? I said, do we have time for questions for Rudolph before Johan? Do we have time? Um, yes, I think so. I'm okay. sorry, I'm, I'm just pulling a, let me check one thing here. Sure. I have a question slash comment if I'm. Yeah, go, sure. Sure. go ahead. Yeah. So I'm, though some of you know me here and others are, I'm happy to meet so many new people. I, your point, society expects us to know our biodiversity. I, I love that. I'm very glad that you put that first in your conclusion. I, and I think of that as a sort of opportunity and challenge at the same time. Um, for myself personally, I know several stories that involve things like when we produce taxonomic lists of species, for a given area, for a country, for whatever, we produce a column that says valid and accepted names for all kinds of reasons. And I have always tried to share that that the very act of doing that tends to imply to the general public that may not be familiar with the way this work is done, that somehow it's finished. We, we have a harder time showing in that same list that we publish, oh, by the way, there's a giant hole here, or Oh, like as you pointed out, we know a lot of things about the large things, but not necessarily the small things. But those don't appear in the lists. They're not visible. So I'm wondering how we can sort of do both things, uh, help society understand that there are gaps and that we're always learning at the same time that we try to meet their expectations by changing the way we work. So I guess I'm, I'm asking really, how do you expect what could we do to address that society expects us to know? Well, I mean, you have this problem even when you teach university students, they will assume that mm -hmm. most species have long been described. And uh, every single time there's a description uh, of a larger number of species in, in Germany, uh, there's actually quite a bit of a response by the public. So I think we need to just start describing the species, the dark tanks are in uh, the countries that we live in. And then slowly but surely there will be an awareness that we don't know very much. Um, and then, yeah, you have journalists asking question, how come you're finding a new species? And then you can also inform the, uh, the press that there is a huge number of species uh, undescribed or not identifiable. I find it much more uh, serious that we are, that we are not able to identify most specimens. Uh, the fact that they're new species is actually not that interesting to me. I think it's the fact that most species are poorly delimited and not identifiable. That's a real challenge. Thank you, Rudolf. Thank you very much for that. There was there was a time when I think most taxon to echo that there was a time when I think most taxonomists learned that it's more fun to find a species 
that you recognize than when you find another new species, right? Like this, there was this time in your training where like, oh, I know this one. Yeah. Other questions for Rudolph? I do hope you join us, Rudolph, if you have time. I'm not sure your schedule, et cetera, uh, for, for perhaps some of the unconference talk. Um, maybe we can further pick your brain, but... Uh, yeah, the problem is more is like seven o'clock here. So yeah, exactly, I, I, exactly. I, I, I need, understood, I need understood. to get like uh, some some lunch, some dinner. Sure, sure. Uh, maybe I can close with one last question. How much of your um, workflow involves um, collaborations with private industry? Um, so you you have a research cluster. Um, are you developing all this in house? Uh, how many of these elements are uh, you know explicit collaborations with with somebody in private in, in industry? Well, the next step will be private industry um, to develop the diversity scanner or getting the diversity scanner built in, in series. Uh, but we're not only building the robot. We have also done like something called the entomoscope, which is a um, microscope you can uh, build yourself uh, by just 3D printing certain parts and then buying the rest and putting it together. Um, so private industry features uh, with regard to the diversity scanner, the robot, um, but with regard to the rest, not so much, although I will have some meetings with uh, private funders of especially uh, um, companies that are wanting to know more about soil biodiversity. I mean, these are like the groups where, where you, the areas where you have to uh, use automated machines to really understand what's in the, uh, in the fauna. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the interest is really is in soil and, and plankton is also a huge area. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I will ask one more here. There's a question for you in chat that you can maybe answer too. But I'll ask you one more. Is there is there like in my mind, um, the hardware requires a software division standing right beside you. And I assume you have people that are working on those level of tools as well. Um, you know that are that are creating that graph of data that links this this sequence, your one sequence, you got a one, 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 one sequence, one specimen, one image, right at the very beginning. So how can you say a little bit about that software development process? Yeah, so we're like, uh, again, trying to make the software as simple as possible. And in some ways, we actually have an easier life than people working on dry collections, because we have one sample having exactly the same metadata. Uh, it's already complying with Darwin core, so we don't have to worry about uh, deciphering labels and all of that. Uh, it automatically gets transferred uh, to the label data or is associated with a specimen identifier. Where we did software development is um, with regard to the barcoding using ONT sequencers, despite their high error rate, you have to have software for getting bar accurate barcodes out of it. We also had to develop um, software for um, sorting specimens to putative species based on barcodes. But all of these software packages are really uh, done with uh, the user in mind, making it as easy as possible to achieve the goal that we need. Uh, yeah, and lit is the same thing. We need like software to get lit uh, automated. So that's once you put in a faster file, uh, the software will tell you what specimens you should be checking because they're likely indicating or they could indicate that there are multiple species in one cluster. Thanks, very informative. Uh, I do have a hand up. I think we're going to take a little time here too. We have one more uh, talk and from, or one more uh, present presentation, I'll say, coming from uh, Johan or some ideas. But Ilya, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, I would like to ask about uh, the uh, nanopore technology of uh, sequencing. Uh, uh, I looked a bit and uh, uh, I, I'm still not sure that uh, it is... Uh, 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 do you have the experience? Is it sufficiently efficient uh, for for barcoding? Yes, I mean, in the old days, there was like some concern that it's not uh, accurate enough. But uh, in this case, you have like a large number of different reads for the same specimen, and you can do internal correction for errors. So we have done uh, a large number of specimens sequenced with Sanger and with Illumina sequencing, and then compared the sequences with what we get with barcoding from Minion devices, and uh, um, they're 99.999 percent identical. So yes, it is accurate enough. Is it cheap enough? Yes, it is. I mean, we can get a barcode for 10 cents, and if you think about capital cost, 
uh, it is uh, essentially none in Minion because you know you get the Minion sequencer with uh, the, uh, the the sample pack where you also get a few uh, flow cells. Um, so it's very feasible to run a barcoding lab at a smaller lab and uh, getting hundreds or thousands of specimens uh, sequenced. It's no longer something that is only for uh, some center in Canada. I mean, you can literally do this uh, at home. And uh, um, how do you are, uh, uh, make the multiplexing of, uh, of so many specimens? Because uh, uh, in the described technology of Nanopore, it was maximum of uh, 96, I think, uh, uh, different uh, uh, yeah. things for, for making the library. Yeah, so that's basically uh, how they make money, right? So they make you like sequence 96 samples on one flow cell. We sequence 10,000 um, barcodes on one uh, flow cell, and that goes through combinatoric. So you just have to have um, tagged primers, forward primers and reverse primers tagged, and then you just have to multiply. So you just have to do the square root of 10,000, and you know how many primers you need, 100, 100 forward, 100 reverse. Uh, yes, that's a that's an ex expense, an initial expense, but then uh, you use those primers for many years. Okay, thanks so much, Rudolf, and thanks everyone for your questions. Um, Rudolf, I would encourage you or offer you, if you find the time, any time in the next three days, to just drop into chat and or the Google Doc, and if you have any links to share to those resources, your hardware, I'm, I'm sure you have some resources out there. Um, if you want to share them to the group, that would be much appreciated.